right. Well, good evening. Um, it is November 3rd and this is the Education Committee of the School Board of Upper Dublin. Uh, with me are Dr. Davis, Ms. Ionetti and Dr. Levinowitz, who are uh, on the Education Committee, along with the other board members. Um, thank you for joining us uh, tonight, especially I see a number of staff members who are joining us and we're very excited uh, about the um, presentation that we're about to hear. Um, I think there's a lot of things going on in district and um, it's very exciting that today we welcomed uh, a whole group of students back to our buildings uh, who had not been there um, before. So um, we're moving forward and I think this is the time uh, I would like to move on to Dr. Yanni for his uh, announcements. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Scherfier. I'd like to take just a few moments to <clears throat> highlight some information and announcements this evening that have been, or that has been added to our frequently asked questions document. As we know, uh, the positivity and incident rates of COVID-19 in our area uh, have surged over the last uh, week to 10 days. And some of the modeling that we're seeing um, based upon um, work done at CHOP, work done uh, in our own county and across the state shows that those numbers are going to remain elevated for uh, some time. That's not to say that um, we won't be able to uh, move forward with our plans to reopen, um, but one of the things that has been stressed time and again by Dr. Rubin, by Dr. Arkush, by Michelle Masters at the Department of Health is that we really need to make sure that folks are adhering to masking, distancing, and uh, good hygiene away from school because what they're seeing is that there is transmission happening and they're seeing it coming from social events. So uh, we wanted to share that bit of information. We also put some information in the frequently asked question about uh, the hybrid schedule at the secondary level. So um, one of the questions that has been asked were, what were the specific reasons and metrics that were not met that caused the administration to look at a hybrid schedule? Um, in our conversations with Drs. Rubin and Arkush, as well as Michelle Masters from the Department of Health, um, time and again, we've, we've heard in the research supports the fact that while elementary age students are not immune from COVID-19, uh, they are less effective and efficient transmitters of the virus. We felt comfortable moving forward with five days a week, given the numbers of students that were staying in the Cardinal Academy at the elementary level. At the secondary students, um, as students age, um, our secondary students have much greater efficiency and potential to transmit COVID-19 as effectively and efficiently as adults. So taking that factor into account and also taking into account what we've heard from um, local and state uh, health officials, we decided to move forward with a hybrid schedule to reduce the number or reduce the density of our secondary buildings and thereby reduce the chance of linked transmission of COVID-19 in our schools. Um, at um, the secondary level, approximately 80% of students um, uh, wanted to come back or their families uh, expressed a desire for uh, them to come back for in-person learning. Particularly at Sandy Run Middle School, space is a big factor um, in keeping uh, kids safe. As we've um, said before, we're um, guaranteeing and promising three to four feet between students and staff um, at a minimum. Um, we know in many cases, or in most cases, we have more than three to four feet between students and staff, but we've promised three to four, and that was not going to necessarily be achievable at the secondary level. Uh, also, uh, Georgia Tech has put out a uh, mathematical model, and um, by running our numbers, we drastically reduce the probability of um, having students infected with COVID-19 or individuals infected with COVID-19 in our buildings um, when we employ a hybrid schedule. 
you know, over the summer when districts were talking about hybrid schedules, um, the hybrid schedules that were being talked about at that time looked like kids in attending uh, in-person instruction for a few days each week, but then those students having to do asynchronous work away from teachers without the benefit of interaction or support from teachers. Um, we wanted to make sure that our students' experiences this year were better than what, um, what the spring looked like. And that's why we decided um, to take on the challenge that our teachers uh, took on the challenge of blended learning. And as we've built capacity in our staff, and I really can't say enough good things about our staff um, for all of the uh, transformative practices they've learned for their um, exponential um, acceleration um, and capacity building and technology. Um, the staff is the staff is fully capable. Um, we have the expertise in our staff to uh, employ a blended learning model. And we've also been asked about um, what metrics we're looking at for bringing students back more than two days a week at the secondary level. Tomorrow evening, our board members, as well as board members from across Montgomery County will be meeting with Drs. Arkush and Rubin, as well as other officials from our local health department. And our superintendent group is working collaboratively with uh, all of these folks to talk about the metrics that are in play. And here's why that's really important. Several weeks ago, we were told that if a county moved from moderate transmission into substantial transmission, we had to immediately close and go all virtual. The Commonwealth um, and, our, and uh, Dr. Rubin, and even um, in some cases, the Pennsylvania Department of Health is softening their stance on when those things need to happen. So we'll be working collaboratively. We anticipate being able to share information if not uh, on Friday, definitely in next week's uh, touch base Tuesday. Um, all of our documents remain updated online, um, specifically in the frequently asked questions document. Any new information is highlighted in yellow, so it allows um, staff and community members, students and families as they're going through that document to be drawn right to the new information uh, very quickly. So um, I wanted to just provide that little bit of information and just remind everyone that we will, for the foreseeable future, be uh, communicating through our Touch Base Tuesdays to provide everyone with updates. Thank you, Mrs. Sharpier. Thank you, Dr. Yanni. And yes, the, if you have not looked yet at the Touch Base Tuesday from yesterday, I think there is a wealth of information um, in there and I uh, hope that people uh, take the time to look at that. Um, the next item on the agenda are the minutes from our meeting October 7th. Um, I just want to check to see if anybody had any comments on it. Uh, I'm not seeing any. Then we'll move that uh, up for approval to the uh, legislative meeting, right? All right, then it's time for our uh, Keith, you, you, yeah. you need to approve those meetings in the committee. Oh, yes. I approve can. the minutes in the committee. I know. You, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. So um, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the October 7th education meeting? So moved. All Second. Right. Thank you. Uh, all in, in favor, say aye. 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 Any, uh, anyone against? No, none. The minutes are uh, for the October 7th meeting are accepted and uh, we'll move to the legislative meeting, right? All right, then um, our presentation for today, it's on blended learning, which is something that um, I think deserves uh, some, some attention. Uh, it's a lot of hard work that went into it, but I think also it's something that is uh, pretty pretty special, um, certainly not a given that that is happening in, 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 in other schools. And I think it shows a lot of foresight and planning to have a model that will work for all of us, whether um, it's the Card Cardinal Academy, it's the hybrid schedule, or hopefully as we move forward into uh, even more in-person instruction down the road. So um, as it, Mr. Hoffman, are you? Yes. Yeah, yes. Thank ahead. you. 
So uh, we, uh, Ms. Penner and I will be presenting on instruction and assessment in the blended learning model. And we have uh, some special guests with us uh, that put some really meaningful work into bringing this to life uh, tonight. So we're gonna give some big picture overviews for everyone, and then uh, we'll ask our experts to jump in at that point. So the next slide, please. As we look at the next slide, you'll see the four pillars of practice that we've been uh, using as our guides for the last several months as we make the decisions. And uh, to just draw attention to uh, these pillars today, we are going to be looking at the equitable practices for all students and ensuring that high quality teaching and learning as it relates to feedback and assessment. Next slide, Ms. Penner. So one of the things that we just want to draw attention to is that blended learning is, is not brand new. It's not something we pulled out of our what to do in the pan middle of a pandemic folder. Um, if you research uh, blended learning, you'll find it's been around for a long time. It's not only associated with the work of Kathleen Tucker, although she's who we're really leaning on um, as her work is very, very teacher friendly. She's a high school English teacher by trade and has a lot of really uh, make it and take it kind of resources that our teachers gravitated towards and we'll be sharing uh, in a little bit. It falls really under the umbrella of the uh, essential elements of the universal design for learning as well. So if you hear those two um, phrases, they both are just centered around really effective educational practices. Things like giving students choice, providing access and opportunities for all learners through the variety of ways in which they can access their content, um, variety of ways for where they can engage in their content. It's not all paper and pencil. It's not all lecture. It's not all memorizing and regurgitating. It's really pushing our staff and our students to think differently and be really um, active participants in the entire instructional practice. So we're seeing some of our really accelerated learners working a lot harder because um, some of those tasks that were previously um, easy for them to memorize and answer on a test are now they're being asked to create um, and activate some of those higher level thinking skills. We're also seeing these platforms, even the playing field for some of our learners who previously have struggled with tasks that are paper and pencil and really heavy with text and uh, memorization and working memory. So for some of our students with disabilities, this really helps them increase their independence and their ability to demonstrate their understanding in multiple means. Next slide, please. Um, so I did reference Catlin Tucker. This is just an example of one of her frameworks where she describes blended learning. Blended learning takes all of those principles that I just described and really places them into what can we do online, what can students and teachers do offline, and how can we maximize that teacher time. We're really working with staff to think about not working harder than the students. So laying out intentional assignments for kids that they can be collaborative with online with their peers, they can be independent with in their creation, and then the teachers can have that one-on-one -on -one check-in time to provide real-time feedback to them. Next slide, Brooke. So uh, the goal in blended learning then, uh, and, and this is the part that I think is uh, most exciting from a teaching and learning perspective, and it's also the most challenging from a teaching and learning perspective, but it's uh, when we think about the goal of blended learning, it's to design lessons that free teachers from the front of the room. To design lessons that free teachers from the front of the room. So as an English example, an English teacher example, um, you know, I would often teach a lesson on thesis statements, and then the students would do some practice with thesis statements and then work on their own thesis statements. And then they would likely turn them into me uh, or do some sort of reflection. And it really, it slowed down this process of what could be happening uh, during that um, class time. And so on the example on uh, the slide uh, there, there we are, uh, you'll see that uh, uh, Ms. D, uh, Ms. D Pasquale at the high school, um, this is an example where she created uh, the playlist model on the left where you can see the steps that they're working through. And so you can see on number three, for example, that they're going to review the thesis statement slide deck and samples and do some reflections about what that looks like. Then they will actually add their thesis statements to a shared document so that their peers can see, can collaborate, 
Ms. D can go in, give some feedback. Um, but if you look to the right of that screen where it says asynchronous workrooms, during class, whether students are live in the room or virtual, students can join the workroom, the breakout room, if you will, the group uh, and the old school pushing desks together. They would join the group of the step of the writing process that they're working on. So some students might need to take a longer time working on an annotated bib or an outline, while others don't need to work uh, through it as deeply or as uh, tediously as others. So it provides that flexibility, but then she can join that thesis development breakout room or the peers in that room can work together. You'll see at the end of each step as you finish work in any assigned room, go back to the main room so that she can check your work, so that she can give some feedback before that next step comes. So it's really inspiring to see how she is transforming her English instruction, her writing instruction, to not be dependent on her being at the front of the room, but being beside the student, whether that's through a computer or you know six feet away in the classroom. Next slide, please. So when we think about then the purpose of feedback, ultimately then preparing us for what we all you know, know is that purpose of an assessment, um, we need to know what students know and what students can do. Oftentimes though, when we think about feedback in a traditional classroom, feedback and assessment is typically done in isolation. So if I'm a teacher, I collect work, I give feedback from the comfort of my home or my office or somewhere, and I hand that back to the student. Now the student interacts with that feedback on their own, and it becomes a really isolated process. The same idea with assessment, it's isolated. You know, I had, uh, as we were preparing for the presentation, I had, uh, you know, flashbacks and a little bit of nightmare about, you know, remembering when I would collect research papers and it wouldn't, 10 minutes would pass and I'd, pass a kid in the hall and he would say, did you grade my paper yet? Uh, and all that he really wanted in that was to know what was the letter that you're going to attach to that grade. And even though I would spend hours and hours providing that feedback to students, he really would turn to the end of that paper and look at what I checked on the rubric and what that final number was. Um, and the idea there is that, hey, for the next assignment, you better fix all of these things. But it's really important to, to realize that that next assignment is going to have a whole different kind of perspective and framework around it. So that feedback is very uh, not specific to that next assignment. Um, so what we're proud of is that this model of feedback can offer ongoing feedback throughout the process. So students know where they are. So hopefully, maybe someday, our students won't need to stop us in the hall and say, did you grade my paper yet? Uh, because they'll know how they did when they submit their paper um, because of the feedback and the ongoing support uh, as we uh, work through the process. Next slide. Is this me, Mrs. Penner? No, I think it might be me. Okay. Um, so there's two different types of assessment. And when we think of assessment, especially the conversations we're having around assessment right now with teachers, it's really thinking about the why. Um, it's not for cumulative point average like Dave was talking about. We're really rethinking grade books. We're really rethinking past practices and thinking what was that information meaningful for, for the teacher or was it meaningful for growth for the student in the moment? Um, so formative assessment is that real-time assessment that's given on a day-to-day -day basis, those quick check-ins, those exit tickets, those thumbs up, thumbs down, do a quick problem and show it to the teacher. It gives you that in the moment um, idea in front of your classroom of how many of the students have mastered the skill, how many of the students need to maybe have another uh, entry point to access it or try it differently or need a little bit more scaffolding and which students are ready to move on. So right now that formative piece is something teachers are really, really relying heavily on. And a lot of the technology tools that we'll be sharing in a little bit, while some people may think it looks like a really long list of tools, that it's important to have variety because depending on the content, the type of activity and the student, um, you want a variety of technology tools so that they can engage and constantly have uh, you know, different opportunities to create depending on what that content is. Schooling, you know, we think of about you study, you learn, you take your notes, you review your outline, and you take a test. So summative is at the end. What we're excited about and what we're seeing now is those summative uh, assessments, while they still are at the end of an instructional topic or unit, 
um, is the variety and the multiple options that kids have in those summative assessments. So their summative assessment could be creating a video. It could be taking something they knew. Um, you know, the teachers ask a lot, but, but how can I prevent them from cheating? You know, when we think about if, if you're worried about cheating, what are you asking them to do and, and what is that going to help them with in the future? So really, what is the content you learn and how can you apply that? How can you create with that? How can you expand on that? And our summative assessments have really taken a life of their own and we're excited about some of the things that we're going to show you um, in a couple minutes. So on the next slide, um, I'd like to introduce some of our elementary staff who are going to be sharing with you some of their um, experiences and their work with staff and their work with students over the last eight, and eight to nine weeks now. Um, we've come a long way. We're really excited about where we are. We're excited to have some kids in front of us this week with welcoming K-2 to back today. We're really excited about Monday of next week as well. Um, but one of the things that we know we're going to continue to rely on are these blended learning types of activities and assessments. Um, we keep reminding teachers, you're not going back to your binder to get out that test that you used to give. You know, we're still going to continue with these practices because this is where we were headed as a district pre-pandemic, and this is where we're excited to continue our growth, um, hopefully soon when we're at the end of it. So um, we have Kathleen Place with us today. She's a reading specialist at Fort Washington. We have Betty Eisenberg, who's going to talk a little bit about foundations. She's a reading specialist at Thomas Fitzwater. We have Matt Dorneman, who's going to talk a little bit about math assessments and science at the elementary level. He is our instructional specialist at Maple Glen. And we have Beth Michaels, who's going to talk about some of those technology tools that I mentioned and how they provide teachers with meaningful data on a more formative level. And Beth is our instructional specialist at Thomas Fitzwater. So I'm going to start by um, uh, having Betty talk a little bit about foundations. Brooke, if that link works, uh, we're ready to click on that on the side. Great. Next slide. Betty? Thanks, Meredith. Um, so here I am in my room at Fitz, um, surrounded by all my foundations materials. Foundations is a wonderful, very interactive, very highly structured phonics program that we use for our students um, in grades K to two. Um, we use it to teach very basic letter formation, phonemic awareness together. And then I'll call on some volunteers to say the word and show me how they tapped it. The same way we might do in class. It's constantly um, using formative assessment to see who can and, and who can't. Um, then we dictate words and have the students find the letters, tapping them and then finding the letters to make the words and showing them on the screen. And you can see a whole screen full of, of the words. Um, you can get a very quick idea of which children are having difficulty in either the encoding or decoding part of the lesson. Um, children learn trick words, words that are not easily decoded. Um, for example, a word like this on cards. And sometimes what I'll do um, I think the example was given by Mr. Hoffman in an earlier presentation where they turn off all their video screens and I'll show the word and you can see all the kids come on as they know the word um, and we'll call on different people to say it. Um, so that's kind of fun for them. Um, so a lot of formative assessment daily as, as the kids are working through this program. At the end of every unit, there is a unit test. Um, the children are dictated sounds and they write the letters. Uh, the kids have the books at home. Uh, some teachers have uh, been able to have this activity um, to be done asynchronously. They have put the, um, the words for the, the prompts on Seesaw and the children do it on their own time on Seesaw and then submit it. Um, some teachers are doing it more um, just put it in the book, write it, and either take a picture and send it in or hold it up. And, and then the teachers have the opportunity during asynchronous time to go over how the children have done on these um, lessons and give some extra support to those who need it before we move on to the very next um, sequenced unit in Foundations. So it's a wonderful program and um, it's been fun actually to, to see how you can adapt it to work um, in this new environment. And as Meredith said, it's very nice to see the kids coming back in the building. It's been lonely. Thanks, Betty. Uh, next slide for you, Brooke. We're going to have um, Kathleen Place talk a little bit about 
our guided reading and our benchmark assessment system. These are both components of our new ELA program, the Fonda Simpanel Classroom. Um, and Kathleen is gonna talk about them, uh, the tenants of them, and also how we've been delivering them in a blended learning environment. Thanks, Meredith. Um, so BAS, we typically use in a typical year, the benchmark assessment system, and we use it to formally assess readers at the elementary level. But since the BAS is a standardized assessment that was designed to be administered in person, Fountas and Pinnell advise not using the BAS during this unprecedented, these unprecedented times. We have some, come up with some alternatives for assessment. We've been using more formally running records that go along with the guided reading books. Um, using these, we can gather information about a student's decoding behaviors and also their reading behaviors um, in the area of fluency. Part of these assessments are having comprehension conversations with the students, and this gives students an opportunity to demonstrate their understanding in three different ways. Within the text, which is they basically summarize the story and give their literal understanding of the story. They demonstrate their understanding beyond the text, which is more thinking inferentially, um, and also about the text, thinking about the author's craft and the genre. Um, also, a little more informally, as teachers read with students during guided reading, they're able to gain such valuable information about a reader's behaviors, and teachers can figure out how they can deepen the skills they already possess and help them grow as readers, writers, and thinkers. Um, and this leads us right into guided reading. Um, so we have put a lot of different um, measures into place to make guided reading really effective during blended learning. Teachers, reading specialists, and instructional support teachers have been working together to create slideshows on Google Slides of our different guided reading texts. This allows the students to access the text and having their own copy of the book really allows them to use strategies that are necessary for successful reading. Like, you know, naturally when you're reading, you might go back and reread a page that you didn't understand or as you're talking about the book and you wanna go back to cite part of it, you can see them scrolling through their slides to get back to that part of the book. So that's been really a helpful tool. Um, some reading specialists have been doing some demo lessons so that the teachers can see what guided reading looks like during blended learning. And this has been a really great opportunity for collaboration to just support one another and really to problem solve through some of those you know, tricky moments. Um, we've also come up with a lot of alternatives for listening to students read. In a typical year, we would pull our chair up right next to them and they would kind of whisper into our ear as they read, um, which you know isn't quite going to work right now. But we've been using things like the breakout rooms in Google Meet. We've been using just the mute unmute feature on the Chromebooks for students. Um, another way we're listening to students read is as we're having comprehension conversations during guided reading and a student might answer a question, uh, the teacher might say, oh, where did you find that in the book? Can you read that part to me? And that's just another chance to hear their oral reading. Um, we've also gotten to employ a lot of technology during guided reading. One feature that a lot of teachers have been using is Jamboard, which is one of the Google applications. And um, you, so you can create actually the picture in the slide on the top right corner there is an example of a Jamboard. You, teachers can create all different types of Jamboards, but we've been using it a lot to make little um, letter cards that once you give students access to the Jamboard, they can man manipulate the letters similarly to how they would use magnet letters. In the classroom, they work on words and word patterns. Um, we've been using, there's a post-it note feature, which we've been using a lot too as a way to spark some discussion or have students like as they're finished reading a couple pages, jot down on a post-it note what they've read so far before they continue. Um, there have been so many wonderful moments in the last couple of months, but one of my very favorite is surrounding the Jamboard during guided reading. Um, I was working with a second grader who she was loving the Jamboard, she was loving manipulating the tiles, and unbeknownst to me, she went home that weekend and created, figured out first of all how to use Jamboard, how to make her own, and made Jamboards surrounding different patterns we had talked about, like different vowel patterns, and she brought them to me on Monday. I was like, so could we use these in our group this week? And it was just such a powerful moment of this little second grader who was so empowered by this tool that not only did she teach herself how to use it, but she was able to apply what we had been learning in the group that week 
to the tool and then share it with others to help others learn. So that was like oh, such a wonderful moment. Um, and I just wanted to end by saying that so many teachers have shared how guided reading, especially during blended learning, is just one of the very best parts of their day because it's just so wonderful to be able to read in small groups or one-on-one -on -one with students and discuss texts and just really get to learn so much about the students as readers and thinkers. So we are really excited about how guided reading has been going and we look forward to how it will continue to evolve. So thank you. Thanks, Kathleen, and thanks for sharing those personal examples. Um, the next couple of slides are Matt Dorneman. He's going to share how students are engaging in formative assessments and summative assessments with teachers in the areas of math and science. Thank you. Um, so I've just got a little bit to say about each one of the, the bullet points on these two slides. Um, so reviewing and practicing on whiteboards is an everyday practice for Eureka math lessons. Cardinal Academy teachers are still using this practice as a valuable assessment. Students compete, com, I'm sorry, students complete a problem on their whiteboard and all hold it up to their camera at the same time. Teachers use this for, for providing a little support on the spot or to create small groups for later. Zern is an asynchronous instructional tool which many teachers use. It guides and engages students through a lesson to teach or reinforce a skill. It also provides valuable feedback about students' grasp of concepts by reporting when and how often students struggled through a lesson. First in Math is an extremely engaging online math practice tool, tool, sorry, math practice tool in a typical or virtual set, setting. Students solve problems to earn stickers, which becomes a school-wide competition between students and classes. For assessment, it provides teachers with valuable feedback about students' basic facts fluency. Problem set pages, homework pages, and application problems are all typical student tasks in Eureka Math. In Cardinal Academy, students complete these asynchronously and can take a picture of their work for teachers to assess their grasp of skills and standards. Teachers use this to support students or provide extension activities. An exit ticket towards the end of a math lesson is a common quick assessment for books. They're being separated into smaller parts and administered, administered a little bit at a time or being given in synchronous small groups. Teachers use all the aforementioned assessments to create small, homogeneous groups in a typical school setting and in Cardinal Academy. Within these small groups, teachers assess students' needs more closely, review student work, and provide extra support. Can you go to the next slide? In Cardinal Academy, teachers are still able to assess students on their grasp of science, concept, science concepts and science terms. They are using many online tools such as Google Forms. One helpful aspect of Google Forms is that it automatically compiles data into a spreadsheet which can be added to as teachers continue to assess students. Teachers have been using Pear Deck to assess students. This resource enables teachers to instruct through a Google Slides presentation and assess students at the same time with embedded tasks. Teachers receive feedback on how each student is grasping the material, and students can get instant feedback to support their understanding. In addition, it is, more, it is more engaging for students by holding them more responsible to follow along. Teachers create, uh, teachers create quizlets of science vocabulary. Students then can study the new terms and test themselves using their Chromebook asynchronously on their own. Students can still engage in project-based learning to show their knowledge. For example, to demonstrate knowledge of the water cycle, third grade students created a model or drew a picture of the water cycle. They then took a photograph, which was submitted to their teacher. They also had the choice to make a video of themselves explaining the water cycle. Teachers in Cardinal Academy have created playlists for students to work through asynchronously. This list of tasks could contain reading passages, instructional videos, online interactive resources, presentations, worksheet activities, and more. Typically, typically, the playlist wraps up with some sort of assessment asking the students to apply their learning. 
Kahoot is always a student favorite. It is just like an on online quiz game show. Students each register and compete against each other by answering questions correctly to win. It's a great review and can provide a teacher with easily accessible feedback. Those are just the few examples how teachers are assessing students in a virtual setting. Thanks, Matt. Um, Beth Michaels is going to talk a little bit about some of the additional tools. And Beth, feel free to highlight if you feel some of the ones we already talked about, um, some of the tools that we didn't touch on and how you see our teachers using them. Great. Thank you, Meredith. Um, yes, this t during this time, our teachers, our students, and our families have had wonderful opportunities to engage with some of these technology tools, um, some of which are new to us and some of which we have had in the past. Um, teachers have expressed that they enjoy using these tools because they improve student engagement, um, they encourage independent learning and differentiated instruction and assessment. It provides opportunities for all students to engage in learning activities. Um, it's allowing them to collaborate across the district and with teachers in their building um, to plan programming and activities for their students. And it's also um, increasing student creativity and ownership of their learning and ways that they can show their understanding of the material that's being presented to them. And um, as you've heard tonight, we've already touched on many of um, the technology tools and you see a long list here. And um, as Mrs. Penner mentioned, it is um, so powerful for teachers to have all of these resources um, and tools um, available to them. And we thank you for your um, ongoing support with these resources. So I'll touch real quickly on some of the things on here that haven't been discussed uh, with you know, the Google Meet and the Zoom. Um, teachers are really enjoying the new breakout rooms, I think, as uh, Matt had just previously mentioned, because it allows students to get breakout and collaborate together. It allows teachers to work with small groups of students or even one-on-one -on -one to support um, students. The other thing is Seesaw. It's our, our new learning management system in grades K and 1, um, and it has been a great way for students to um, share work with their teachers and to get feedback on that work, not only from their teachers, but even from their families. So it's increased um, communication between home and school. One of the best parts of it is, again, that student choice. Um, there are various activities and students can respond with things like uploading a document, writing, um, videos, um, recordings of themselves. So it gives them a lot of ownership in how they want to express their learning. Um, again, Screencastify is something that teachers have been able to use to provide instructional videos and support for their students. They could even give communication or feedback to students where they can see um, their face in the communication. Um, it allows uh, students also to possibly share work with their teachers um, as well. Um, and it has allowed us to also do things to celebrate students, such as our first in math announcements that we do um, each week. And I know that means a lot to our students. Um, Edpuzzle is a relatively newer um, application for us to be using this year. It allows um, for videos and multiple choice and open-ended um, questions and like videos that are presented to students. One of the powerful things that teachers and students have mentioned about Edpuzzle is that it is student controlled. So students can, you know, go back and review something if they're not sure of, you know, um, a concept that was asked. Um, it also gives um, teachers a quick, quick way to check in with comprehension and it allows them to leave even notes of teaching points for students along the way to help to guide them. Um, Nearpod is another one where they have interactive activities and assessments. It lets teachers create different kinds of quizzes and it gives them um, almost like immediate feedback and then valuable reports on student um, performance and where their strengths and needs are. Um, and they can actually write and draw on it. And let's see, Mr. Dorneman talked about uh, mystery science, so I won't go into that. So the last two would be Flipgrid, um, which again um, has allowed students to do things like record themselves. I know a fun activity with some of our younger grades is where they share their Halloween costume with, their, with a little short video clip. Um, sometimes teachers are using it for fluency checks when they're allowing children to read. Um, they've had students share their writing um, and to reflect on some of their writing um, as well. And lastly is Newzella, um, and that is a um, 
program that has different um, reading passages on a variety of topics, but the really cool thing about that is that it allows teachers to push them out in various lexiles on the same topic. So that is a way for all students to um, be able to engage in the learning. Um, and it also involves things like current events and has quizzes that give teachers valuable information um, on their students' progress and things that they're doing. Um, so these tools are just some of the many that teachers have. And again, I just want to make sure I end by saying we thank you um, for all your support with that because I know that these have been very powerful tools for teachers. Ms. Evans, if you can go back to the main presentation. And the next slide. And then her presentation is linked uh, right there. All right, Mrs. Kowalski. There it is. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to be here and to highlight some of the awesome things that secondary math is doing to formatively and summatively assess our students. Um, well, the tools I'm highlighting aren't really brand new and our teachers have been dabbling in them for a couple years now. Um, this blended learning push and you know the Cardinal Academy start has really um, allowed us to grow in our expanses with them to um, reach teachers that have never tried them, tried it before and everyone's kind of falling in love with them. So I'm excited to share them with you today. So the first one I'm going to talk about is Desmos. Um, Desmos is an online platform and it is free um, and it's fabulous. We have the Desmos app loaded on the students Chromebooks already. We use them for calculators, but it can do so, so, so much more. So um, there is teacher.desmos and student.desmos. And what I have here is going to be kind of a splattering of what we see. So this is an example of an assessment that we would give in a math class. And right now it's anonymized, so everybody has like a really mathy name, so I didn't put anyone on the spot here. Um, but you can see the questions across the top. Uh, the little dots that you're seeing shows us that a student is either on that slide or has the upper right corner, like there's a blue triangle or a gray one. And the blue one means there's new, new feedback for the student. The student gets an alert. And it also alerts the teacher that they haven't read it yet. It turns gray when, once the student has read it. Um, and Desmos is so, so powerful. It's extremely interactive. Now, the one I'm going to show you here, they're just writing on the slides, but there's a lot of different coding. Um, teachers across the nation have gone crazy with this, and we're all learning kind of how to do this backwards coding that the slides can now self-correct, or it can give hints, or they can move a dot to discover, you know, which one should be less than or greater than. It's just amazing. Uh, let's look at the next slide. And this is all just right in real time when it's happening. Uh, so again, this is a this is a closer up glance at a teacher dashboard, so I can see what I'm looking for, see how the kids are graphing, see what they're writing, look at their work. I'm able to click into a student, which I think is the next slide if you want to go in. I'm going to jump around here, right? So if I'm focusing on one student, um, that little blue circle with the comment opens up a uh, feedback for the kid. Um, and here you can see that I'm writing notes, they get attached to the specific slide and the student can respond to that um, and edit slides as necessary. So again, Desmos really very powerful tool that we are utilizing a lot in secondary math. Um, and not just for, for not just for assessment, we use them, um, we create lessons around them that are discovery based, student centered, it opens up great conversation or it can also be done as an asynchronous where you'll see that student uh, teachers are putting in uh, little video clip. So, you know, watch this one minute video. Okay, now try this problem. And then, then there's usually a reflective slide after that. How did it go? Do you still need help? Join the Google Meet, join this breakout room, and then it kind of can repeat through that. So it's just, you know, opportunities are endless with Desmos. All right, next one. I'll try and be as excited about Pear Deck as I am about Desmos. So we are also using Pear Deck, and I know Matt talked about Pear Deck a little bit, but I'll just give you um, from the assessment side. Uh, these are the options when a teacher is creating um, any sort of interactive piece for the student. So students can type, students can draw. Uh, there's the draggable piece as well, which is always neat if you're trying to assess uh, students really quickly and see like, put your, you know, put the dot on the thumbs up or the thumbs down if you understand what's going on. Um, obviously there's numbers. Uh, go ahead, we'll go to the next slide there. Uh, 
Um, so here I was just pointing out if we're sharing this, uh, presenting our screen, maybe in a Google Meet to all students, also on the Avery board for students in our class, we can open up responses and, and start class discussions about that. So, oh, what did, what do we notice the student did here? And that, you know, it opens up the conversation for uh, the math skills that they're working on. Uh, Pear Deck, like Desmos, can be both student or instructor paid. So it's great for an assessment. It's also great for instruction. Um, okay. And then again, uh, like Matt had said, the teachers can see exactly what the students are doing. So this is a clicked in zoomed version on one of the students. Um, so I'm able to monitor the work as well as there's a little speech bubble at the bottom. That's where I can provide feedback on Pear Deck. Again, the student can get it and respond to it. And you don't have to wait till after the assessment's over. We're commenting the second they're writing on things. Next up is our Schoology platform actually is a fantastic resource for assessment. Um, so teachers, again, have dabbled in Schoology assessments over the past couple years, but now we're really utilizing the platform. So if you want to go ahead, um, the, the opportunities here for the types of questions that you can ask students is amazing. Uh, so I think if you even looked from a Schoology quiz that maybe a teacher was using in September to one they're looking forward to using in November, like we've really just grown in our knowledge and understanding of how to use Schoology assessments. Uh, so there's a list of every type of question that you can ask them. Um, and like Beth had mentioned, like we can, we're assessing in new ways now. So maybe the, there, there's an audio question where they're just explaining uh, property or how they would start steps to solve something. So it's really, it's been, it's been a huge learning curve, but an awesome one. Can go on to the next one. So this is just one type of, I stole this. Uh, it's a real assessment question. I stole it from one of our math teachers. Uh, it was given already, but this is pretty cool. So they, they're finding ways to put math into these Schoology assessments. So it's a drag and drop, probably originally used for maybe science where you're labeling a cell, but they turned it into kind of a a matching drag and drop here. Go ahead, we'll see another one. Here is we're using a sketch. So we can preload images into Schoology and then the students have the ability to draw on them. So here we're looking for different ways they're drawing lines, segments, and rays. Uh, but again, really, really neat tool. And then I think I have one more on that. So another thing you'll see is we still, teachers are still providing, especially as you get into the high school upper level maths opportunity for the traditional style of test. So here's two different versions through file upload options. We can either have students do handwritten work at home, paper, pencil, if that's what they're more comfortable with. And then they're scanning or taking pictures of and uploading the work. So that's what you see on the right. And then on the left, they also have the digital version. So this was a Cami. Um, they turned it in through Cami, so everything was done digitally on their stylus. But they're both very clear, and teachers, I, I don't think, prefer one or the other, or really whatever the student is most comfortable with. Okay. And then um, Alex, while this isn't available for all students, we are using it in sixth grade math and some of our eighth grade math courses. So I just wanted to highlight some of the formative pieces uh, and summative assessment pieces of Alex. So go ahead. The first one is the famous Alex pie chart. So if you're monitoring a class, the pie charts broken up into standards and skills by color. Um, and then it also will tell you overall your class is ready to learn these skills coming up, which is nice if you're going to do some group work that day or break them into um, groups of the student needs to focus on this skill versus this skill. Uh, so that's one of the benefits of Alex. You can see this class is uh, ready to learn, you know, they're all ready to learn kind of at the same pace because we're doing something a little differently this year with Alex. Uh, it is a personalized pathway, but uh, this year our teachers have created modules uh, that follow to kind of keep the kids a little bit just because we weren't sure exactly how free we wanted them to be if we weren't going to see them all. Um, in person, it was just a better way to start the year. Um, so we're a little bit more structured while still personalized. Next slide. 
Um, so here is, um, you can go by objectives or standards in Alex. So here you can see that progression since it is set, the kids are kind of, they're on their own pace, but they're on a pathway that they're all taking at the same time. Works better for group work and that sort of thing. So you can see that they're moving right along, 100% mastery, 100% mastery, 100, you know. So they're still working on the one that says 93, and you can see they haven't gotten to that fifth bullet point yet or sixth bullet point. You can see that. Again, Alex, great for standards monitoring. Next one. Um, so I already kind of spoke about that. Uh, the teacher designed for the personalized pacing. And again, you can see module one, 97% of the students have mastered and are moving in um, and around. And you can see that module five obviously is not as populated yet because some people are not ready for that yet. And that's perfectly fine. Um, and then I wanted to highlight the knowledge checks, which is an awesome component of Alex. So every so often, about 20 topics, I think, a knowledge check pops up, it asks them questions, it's adaptive, and it always goes back and cycles through even topics that they may have mastered already, technically in Alex, they'll get asked again because they wanna make sure that the retention is still there as well. So knowledge checks are another huge win on Alex. Okay. Um, I could talk forever about the things that we are using. Like Beth mentioned, there's just so, so much out there um, and our teachers, use whatever is you know the best for that particular lesson or topic. You already heard about Jamboards, Google Form, Padlet. Whiteboard Fi, I know Matt talked about, and I think Betty talked about holding up whiteboards. Whiteboard Fi is just the digital version of that. So some of our secondary math teachers are using it. Um, I could push out whatever I'm writing on my whiteboard to the students, so maybe it's a problem, and then they all can instantly solve it. And just like Pear Deck or Desmos, I can watch as it's happening. They don't actually have to hold it up. Um, CK12 is a platform, we used it for our summer work and we're continuing to use it. It's a great resource, it has videos and adaptive practice. It's another one that monitors um, their knowledge checks, so we do use that um, sometimes for, you know, asynchronous work, sometimes for a little quiz grade. Khan Academy is similar, um, those are both free open resources. And then, as Matt mentioned, like Kahoot's a fun example of something, Quizzies is like a Quizlet. And then Flipgrid, you'll even see our, some of our assessment pieces now have one Flipgrid question where the student models exactly how to solve the problem and they talk through it. Um, we've had students jump on and, and put their own problem, have a student solve it, they you know, correct or enhance what they're doing. It's fun, so it's been great. That's a little snapshot of assessment in secondary math. Thank you. Thanks, Meg, and thanks to uh, uh, Betty and Kathleen and Beth and Matt. Uh, we'll now, next slide, open it up to any questions from uh, the committee. All right. Um, uh, for the committee members, are there any questions to our presenters? Uh, I see Dr. Levinowitz. Do you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, a technical question. How, how do they, what do they use to do the math problems so that you see it, Meg? Is, I mean, is, is there a, a stylus or are they on their Chromebook? Uh, yes, they typically are using their, if it's a digital, they're writing with their stylus. I guess some write with their finger. Um, and then there are some students that prefer to type. Or I don't know if anyone caught it on one of my examples. It was like 26 out of 28 responses because I had two students that opted to just write everything on paper and then screenshot okay. pictures in. And you have Albert Einstein as one of your students, which I think is awesome. Yeah. Uh, and so, so Mr. Hoffman, uh, how, how do you assure consistency and creativity across the grade level? <laughs> I can speak to uh, probably the easiest way, uh, Dr. Levinitz, would be to say that if, if you, what I noticed most out of these presentations about the 5E frameworks since March and about blended learning is that it all ties back to the standard. And so there are lots of pathways. Blended learning is about differentiating pace, product. Uh, there's, there's two others that I'm blanking, but uh, it all ties back to that learning standard, that objective. And if the lesson is tied to that objective, you can see on each of the presentations today that some students may have shown a different way to get there, but the, 
the teacher's feedback to that individual student on that specific standard is that way that helps us get there. Ms. Kowalski shared that, um, you know, the grade level team, for example, uh, d decided to make some choices with Alex about developing those modules and kind of keeping some pace. And it's really great to see uh, at the beginning of a year that there were some fears from a lot of our, our you know, I, I'd say not even just our community, but across, you know, the United States and the world about the, uh, uh, from the spring closure to see that we have such great mastery immediately in those first two modules is inspiring. So I would go back to that standards uh, planning. Okay, but to ensure consistency, I mean, uh, the, uh, well, the standards are what is consistent. The standards are dictated to us by the okay. state. And so, I'm, I'm yep. sure you'll find some teachers who are much more adept at this and some mm -hmm. others that are struggling. And I'm sure we're doing as much as we can to get uh, teacher to teacher interaction and, and sharing of resources and, and and coaching, you know, colleagues. Absolutely, and you know, having the collaborative time daily uh, has been very uh, um, uh, helpful, for lack of a better word, uh, for them to share those resources, to not have to have each teacher creating those instructional materials, uh, but to be able to collaborate with. Through Pear Deck, walk through flip classroom, walk through Ed Puzzle, like they're just, and, and I went to almost every session and the teachers are just there and they want to learn and they're trying, you know. You know, Mrs. Pe Mrs. Penner, you would you? Figure out how, how, just how complex or how much work is involved with everything that our teachers are doing. When I looked at that fairy tale case study playlist uh, in, in the presentation tonight, is that just one lesson or is that, is that lesson spread out over a week or, you know, so the fair the teachers putting this together it's it's a lot and when you think about what teachers are doing virtually i mean i i forget what the statistic tells us but it's really on average i think it's anywhere from five to ten minutes per minute of instruction when it comes to having to plan for this virtually for virtual delivery and so you know because as that playlist is great and and you know as my example with creating the resources to teach that thesis statement in a flipped way you know you've got to take the time to create that and then use the time in class to give that feedback so it's really shifting how we work um, but it definitely we're trying to r remind ourselves and our teachers to take care of themselves and to pace and as meg said to share with one another and yeah. to not be afraid you know um our illustrative math for example i feel like we're using a lot of math examples but yeah. the illustrative math has a lot of videos that come with that program so that you know our teachers want to create their videos to teach their kids but we have to continue to remind them yeah. to use the resources that go along with our programs so that they don't feel like they need to create you know every single tutorial um because uh you know that that's not working smarter uh, in most it cases. It sounds like it's a ton of work, you know, and, and, and that, you know, I just wanted to give, you know, a thank you to all the teachers for, I think, probably working even harder now than they were before. Uh, Absolutely. So Absolutely. I'll stop. I'm sorry. I see a couple more hands up. So let's go to Miss Ionetti. Um, I want to also thank our teachers. This, this is a very impressive list and I'm, I'm just amazed that um, we can do all this. And I'm just curious, like what tools do you think will continue to be used when we go back to regular classrooms? I know I heard you love Desmos, Meg. Um, anything else that you really see is going to be part of the daily routine? You know, we did a, a lot of work last year because we had some redundancy in many of the uh, programs that we had access to. Um, and we weren't using some of the programs that we did have access to, to the extent that they could. Um, we were, like most districts, offered a lot of free access in the spring for a lot of resources. We tried to not bite on a lot of those because we didn't want to get hooked into something that uh, we either didn't need or wouldn't be able to sustain. Um, right now, through CARES grant and some other uh, uh, 
uh, resources. We were able to offer a lot of resources this year. All of our professional learning, though, uh, through the summer talks about, you know, having a toolbox of no more than five tools that a teacher uses. Um, and some of our teachers struggle in that area because, you know, as Meg said, sometimes like one of these tools works so well and you want to try it. Uh, but Tony Giamarco, our social studies uh, coordinator, often says, you know, but stick to the one that you use daily. Like it doesn't have to be the fanciest one because if it's a new tool just for the sake of using a new tool, that can be a barrier for kids. Um, so I imagine that we're going to have a lot of needs assessment uh, looking here to see what we do want to use moving forward now that we're continuing to expand blended learning and get better at that, um, I think our needs are going to be a little different uh, for some of the resources. So we definitely have some that we're going to fight to, to not lose. And then it'll come down to uh, really looking at it from a perspective of what does that tool offer? Uh, that's something that we have doesn't offer, you know, so that'll be That'll be a, a challenge for us because we're really falling in love with a lot of these resources, I think. I think from an elementary perspective, Dave, we're going to be using a lot of these same resources when kids are in front of us in their desk. You know, we're looking at safe ways to get books in their hands, but we're also looking at safe ways for them to engage in collaborative work in small groups, which will be most likely on their Chromebooks and kids to be participating in those daily five rotations and their small group math rotations. And those things are going to be continuing to be with Chromebooks for the most part. You know, they'll have access to their own supplies of manipulatives and, and things that they can and be a little bit more hands-on with. But a lot of these systems will continue to be in place for the remainder of the school year and most likely in the future because it's really great um, instruction and it's a, it allows teachers to really differentiate those station rotations um, more flexibly. And just as an example, uh, quickly, that Beth, Beth Michael shared, you know, some of the resources, some of the features, rather, of Seesaw, which our K-1 students are using. Uh, and I know uh, Betty talked a little bit about that as well, and um, management system, you know, where we wouldn't have needed something like that in kindergarten or first grade in the past, we're seeing the value of being able to really build that uh, for our students. And so that's going to be where those choices, you know, those tough choices that I mentioned, uh, Mr. Zionetti, are going to come Thank you. All right. Um, Dr. Davis, go ahead. Yes, I, several of my questions have already been asked, but um, I guess I want to begin with just commenting on the presentation itself. Um, it was really exciting to hear some of the real examples of what um, everyone is doing in the classroom with, with students. And um, I'm really impressed um, with just the level of teacher collaboration that's going on. Um, it's not often that teachers have that opportunity, but I know when they're given the opportunity, um, wonderful things happen. And that is um, what then turns around to make wonderful things happen for our students. So just wanna really thank the teachers for what they're doing. Um, even the teachers that are here this evening that they taught all day and now they're here, you know, sharing with us. So um, I just can't say enough about the work that they're doing and how much we appreciate um, what you're doing to make everything successful for our students. Um, I guess um, my question really is, and it's been um, sort of talked about already, but it's really, you know, directed to the teachers that are with us this evening. Um, my question is, what do you see as some of the challenges and or the opportunities of transitioning um, from the Cardinal Academy to the in-person learning? Who wants to go first? I think Mrs. Eisenberg, I see you uh, waiting to answer. Go ahead. Um, well, I can um, speak for myself. Um, first, I wanna thank the school board as a member of the community and as a member of the staff. I really wanna thank the school board and the administrators for everything they've done. I can't imagine what it must be like to be an administrator right now or a school board member in these times. Um, thank you for all the support and making possible all these different materials and, and programs and, and hard, hard hard materials like computers and whatever 
Um, so thank you. Um, the reason I was laughing is because for me specifically, um, one of the challenges is going to be that I will be teaching, as a reading specialist, I'll be teaching students in front of me as well as Cardinal Academy students at the same time. So part of why I'm still here is that we are um, very busy making slides and collaborating among the reading specialists, making slides for the reading program that we use with our media students so that the students who are at home will have access to the books that we'll be using here and we can um, share screens with slideshows of each of those books. And for every student, it's um, for the primary grade students, it's a book a day. So it's a slideshow for every student every day um, who's in Cardinal Academy. So that's, that's, that's a, it's a challenge that we're facing right now, but we're up to it. <laughs> we can do it. That's fantastic. All right. Is there any, any of the other teachers who want to respond? Uh, I, I guess, you know, thinking that we're going back in person and it's kind of like a new normal to us and a new normal to the students. Um, so I think, you know, teachers are, you know, working through what that's going to look like. I think that they are um, very grateful to have a lot of these resources that we've highlighted tonight to have them, whether in any environment, whether we're in the Cardinal Academy, whether we're in person or we're, you know, whatever, wherever we're teaching. Um, so, you know, I agree with Mrs. Eisenberg, it'll, it'll be challenging to teach some in front of us and some at home, but I do think that, um, you know, we're up to that challenge. And um, I love the collaboration that has been going on. So, and I think that that will continue and it'll cross over between teachers and students that are in person with us, as well as our Cardinal Academy, so that we have like consistency and we can support and learn and grow from each other. Um, so I think those are some of the things that I, I'm looking forward to and think, you know, maybe slightly challenging, but I think as Mrs. Eisenberg said, we are definitely up for the challenge, especially with all of your support. All right, great. Thank you. Um, I think um, Ms. Fransek uh, has a few words to say too. Thank you. Um, I just really wanted to comment more than anything on some of the positives that, you know, <clears throat> it's been a challenging eight months. But what I saw tonight was the sort of silver lining that comes from great challenges being met by great individuals and great teams. And uh, in particular, suddenly, due to unforeseen circumstances, the entire district, all the teachers, you are embracing a new style of teaching, tools that you might not have expected to be using with great facility, in just a short period of time and meeting our kids in a way that is so equitable across all grade levels um, by giving everyone access to these personalized tools to these mechanisms of showing their learning in a way that is truly individualized so i, I just again to add to the kudos from the rest of the team to this evening and to the leadership team for allowing you all to take risks I mean, you have to be able to trust that you can take the risk and try it and know that if it doesn't work as well as you want, you can try something new the next day. So I hope that we can continue to be that supportive system from a funding perspective, from a, you know, just a support of your work uh, to help you continue to know that you can continue to do that um, and feel good about it. Um, so it's really just mostly a thank you and a, a kudos for the team. You know, Mrs. Francis, one of the things that I think is really um, unique in all of this is we've had a lot of conversations about what it looks like to really empower our staff and, you know, who do you really make rules for? And I think because staff has been empowered, we have seen um, a really great acceleration of capacity in terms of not only technology but instructional strategies and i and i i'm so glad that the board members uh got to hear directly from some of our teachers because i think it's really important for everyone in our community to know just how hard our teachers are working and with such an intentional focus and level of expertise it's really been great to watch um, everybody advance their their skills whether they were already great with technology or whether they were um, technophobic, right? We've seen great movement um, in all of our 
teachers, and quite frankly, and all of our administrators as well, because you know, one of our expectations is if we're going to ask teachers to do something, we should be doing it as well. So um, just like our teachers are learning new things, our principals and our directors and our central office team are also learning right alongside our teachers. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think I would like to add to that to the extent that um, I think there is a deliberate plan to move things forward. This is not just sort of ad hoc haphazard, but there is it's clearly a different a plan and I have many kudos also uh, to, to the teachers for stepping up and being players and especially doing all the hard work over the summer to really prepare because this doesn't happen by itself. I mean, it takes time. I think the, one of the, the really impressive things is also it puts teachers in the, in, in the, in a learning environment. So they become learners and get out of their comfort zones just in the way as we ask students to get out of their comfort zones and, and try things. Um, one of the things to me that is really appealing is the fact that there is much more opportunity for feedback and that students become more, more integral into that, that it's not just that a grade was done to them, but they really, uh, the feedback is ongoing. And so, so for me, what I'm hearing and seeing, I think is that we're really as a district are making a big leap forward in the way um, teaching and learning is happening. And I'm really excited for the, that to continue. And, and I think in some ways that as, as, as difficult as this, um, um, pandemic is that there may actually be a really big silver lining there in the way that um, teaching and learning um, will continue and the technology is a big part of it our, our students and our staff and our leadership they're all part of uh, or the leadership team are all big part of that and as a team to move that forward and I also don't want to exclude the, the parents who provide the support at home um, to uh, for their roles in this so i think to me this is something as a that a, that a team is bringing when people work together is moving forward and uh, it's probably it's never going to be perfect but i think we're making a real big stride forward which i'm i'm a support member but as a community member i'm really 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 grateful for so on that note i think um perhaps we need to move on to the next part of the uh agenda um so um mrs evans can you put the agenda uh up so that we because i know we have to there's a approval um that's coming yes thank you um so um there was a uh learning grant that was um awarded um to um by the by the department of education and um i think dr Perez, do you want to say anything about the 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 grant sure thank you um we're really pleased to have been awarded this grant for six thousand dollars um to work um on uh resources for universal design for learning um, the grant is awarded through PATAN, which is um, a, an arm of the department that helps support um, schools um, with a lot of different uh, resources and training opportunities. Uh, three teachers at our high school are going to participate in this grant as well um, and be part of this process uh, moving forward this year. Our desire is to start at the high school with uh, universal design and then um, share our learning with uh, teachers and staff at other grade levels. Um, this grant was you know, written with the understanding and um, in connection with the um, district strategic plans and their, um, uh, um, the common thread that is woven throughout the um, strategic action plans around making sure students have access equitable access to college preparatory work um, and understanding how uh, universal design for learning can give all students that access. So we're real, real excited to begin our first um, <clears throat> our first kind of event or opportunity is on the 20th where we'll um, get a grant overview and come to understand everything that's going to happen with the grant. Dr. Katie Novak who is a 
um, national expert in uh, universal design for learning is the consultant that's working on this grant with um, Patan and PDE. The best thing about this is for some of the folks that are listening right now might be thinking, wait, we just talked about blended learning. Now we're doing universal design. It's really all the same thing. Um, really at the end of the day, what we're really focusing on is building instruction, building curriculum, building assessments, building school that respond dynamically to kids, not the other way around. And so um, all of these things that we're talking tonight all fall under that same umbrella. Um, blended learning, UDL, it's all about what is the content that I have to deliver who are the kids in front of me and how do we meld those things together to get the best benefit? Um, and it takes multiple pathways and it, it could take multiple routes. Um, and it, and it, and it's, it's at the end of the day, it's providing better instruction, more equitable instruction, more college and career ready instruction for our kids. So it's really exciting to see uh, everything coming together. And as Dr. Perez said, really aligning to our uh, strategic plans uh, that we have in play. All right. Um, uh, are there any board members who have any uh, questions, comments? I'm not seeing any. I just um, um, I thank uh, the leadership team for putting this, applying for the grant and getting it awarded. I think I got the impression it was uh, competitive. So. Um, glad we are able to get the benefit of these um, this expertise um, all right the next item is uh, conferences there are I believe there are two um, or there's one conference that we have two members uh, attend um, Dr. Yanni is there any anything in particular that the board should be aware of no both of these conferences have been deemed appropriate by administration um, we don't bring things to the board unless we feel that they're uh, necessary. So we, we um, are seeking or recommending approval of these. Um, I think um, both of the attendees of this conference will walk away uh, with enhanced practice um, and which will obviously positively impact our kids. Great. Um, any questions? Um, and then I think we can move this on to the legislative meeting for approval. This is sure, Pierre. I just want, if I could, you know, in the in the past, um, there's been some commentary about the the amount of money that we've spent on conferences. Um, I really do want to highlight the Office of Teaching and Learning and how we're looking at providing professional learning for staff. And as you've seen over the last couple of months, um, there's there have been fewer requests for conferences. And that doesn't mean that there's not as much professional learning uh, going on. It just means that we're looking at things differently and how we can provide that professional learning um, within our own district. Yeah, and I think I think we we've certainly seen the benefit of that uh, in, in, in tonight's presentation. But also, I think there's there is certainly with all the technology, a lot of expertise in house, and people are growing that um, and exploring options. And um, that's a good use of time and, and uh, less less money at the moment, which is good. Um, um, our next item on the agenda is community input. So um, we'll ask in a moment, um, Ms. Evans to, um, to take, uh, to open uh, for community input. So anybody who is in attendance, if you want to raise your hand, your virtual hand, that so that we can acknowledge you. And then you have four minutes in which uh, you can speak and uh, please state your name and the where you reside in the township. Go ahead, Ms. Vitella. Hi, everybody. Jenny Vitella, um, Amber. So um, I want to ditto uh, what everyone said about how wonderful and how hard working the teachers are. I know this has been no small task. I um, anecdotally, I've talked to several people that I know. Um, I see it because I'm home with three children that are going through it. I see what they're going through. Um, so 
I want, I, it is obvious how hard it is, how much time consuming it is. But again, we are coming to uh, a good collaborative end space, which is good. I, you know, it's all good. Um, but <laughs> in quick summary, I counted 24 different computer programs of sort and they all seem to be for assessments and practice problems and I wonder where's the teaching is the teaching being done by teachers to children whether they're face-to-face -face and soon to be um I mean face-to-face -face in the computer or soon to be in-person learning are the teachers actually teaching a lesson and then these programs these one of these 24 programs way to do practice problems and follow up um because I'm afraid I'm I'm afraid the one thing I didn't hear a ton about in this whole presentation that was wonderful and everything's great are the kids. Because I feel like we're, the teachers are doing a lot of wonderful work. Administrators, certainly, everybody's doing great work. Parents, <laughs> I'll give myself some uh, kudos for that. Um, but how, how is this translating to the students? Have we really looked at how they're absorbing this information or gaining knowledge? Um, again, I feel like there's some responses from children that I've heard beyond my own are, I'm not learning anything, I'm bored, all I do is stare at my, my Chromebook, um, no one's teaching me anything, um, asynchronous all the time, I'm just filling out these problems, you know, um, and I just wonder how much, and in some classes, the cameras aren't even required, so I don't even know how necessarily the teachers know. That. Also, some people have talked about and I don't hear us talking about in Upper Dublin, um, block scheduling. I know we're doing block scheduling at the high school AB days. I know that's not necessarily ideal, but it's okay for this virtual, but block scheduling where you'd have one semester of three classes or four classes, and then another semester of four classes, more like college. And I just wondered uh, if that's something Upper Dublin's ever considered, looked at, or reasons why we had not. Um, I think that's all for now. Um, I thank you, Dr. Yanni, for uh, saving money on those conferences. I know uh, one year I, my friend and I added them all up and it was thousands and thousands of dollars. And so, yes, I think it's great that our teachers are teaching each other and working together collaboratively. And I think that's great. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Pazarina. Hi everybody, this is Jamie Passerina. I live in Drescher. Um, I just wanna start off by saying in order to learn more about the blended learning, I did watch the video presentation by Mr. Hoffman that was included in the TouchBase Tuesday. The presentation was titled Blended Learning in a Hybrid Model. So I'm really still struggling to understand that those who have opted for five days a week in person, um, visualizing what this is gonna look like in the brick and mortar classroom. Um, I understand that the blended learning, it's a combination of the face-to-face -face instruction and the online learning. Um, and I really tried to look at the three models that were highlighted in the presentation. Um, but it does seem like the opportunities for the face-to-face -face teacher instruction is minimal. From the station rotations um, to the flipped classroom and to the playlists, which just seems like a, a flow chart of items that guides students through what they need to do to, to uh, complete an assignment. Um, there's a heavy emphasis on asynchronous instruction and it's relying on independent work by students. As a family, we opted for in-person instruction due to the ex excess of screen time and the challenges that we experienced with virtual instruction. So for my peace of mind and so that my family can better understand what is gonna happen when we return, um, what approximately would be the percentage of face-to-face -face instruction in a traditional model of teaching versus the blended learning model? Um, I think the examples that were provided tonight for the online instruction, they were very interesting and visually appealing, but it really does give students more screen time. And it's going to replace a lot of pencil and paper tasks. And there's research that shows that writing by hand will activate parts of the brain that help with attention and memory and things like that. So there's research to support the good old pencil and paper tasks as well. Um, during online peer collaboration, who facilitates the process to make sure that students are remaining engaged? And um, 
for any student who receives related services. Um, I'd like to know when the parents will be informed as to when, how these services will be delivered and uh, will they, if they are delivered in person, will the providers also be teaching students online at the same time? Thank you for your time. Go ahead, Ms. Greiner. Hi, Brandy Greiner, um, Ambler. Um, I first wanna start off tonight by saying um, and just agreeing with um, some of the stuff Jenny said. Um, the teachers have been absolutely amazing. Um, I know this is not an easy thing for any of them and they have um, shown us what they're capable of. These teachers are putting in countless hours beyond the day um, and I just hope that that's acknowledged by the district. Um, I just wanna say my kids, all three of my students, um, Fort Washington, now Jarrettown, um, Sandy Run and the high school are loving Cardinal Academy. Um, they have nothing but positive things to say and their grades are the best they've ever been. Um, so just on the flip side of some of the other things that were said, um, my kids are doing amazing. Um, and that is, you know, all credit to the teachers. Um, continuing on the Cardinal Academy thing, um, I just wanted to state that I am disappointed in the communication about Cardinal Academy since we decided um, that students were going back in the building, which again is fabulous for those 80% that want to go back in. Um, the 20 that are in Cardinal Academy, um, the communication has pretty much stopped. Um, the beginning of the school year, we focus so much on get to know your teachers, get to know your teachers, get to know your teachers. Here's a video, here's an email, um, here's your special teachers, here's this, here's that. And um, for the kids who were in Cardinal Academy, staying, the switching teachers, uh, that was not done for any of the specials. Um, so you have a child who was a Fort Washington student who is now a Derrickton student, uh, knows Two other kids in the class um, now does not know his gym teacher who he met today for the first time. Um, and it was, hi, I'm your gym teacher. Okay, let's get started. Um, there was not much, and again, I know everyone's busy, um, but there was not much planning or information that went into joining those two schools. So it was all Jarrett Town announcements this morning. Um, you know, the Jarrett Town Pledge, which again is great and Parker will learn it, but it would be nice if those kids who are Fort Washington kids would also be getting their Fort Washington Pledge. And I will say um, the teacher acknowledged that this morning um, and she is looking into incorporating that. Um, but even tonight- Trinta, can you hear me? Yes. Um, in regards to our current state of education in the Upper Dublin School District, I'd like to specifically speak about uh, the mental health of many of our middle and high school students and how the current virtual learning environment that was chosen by the board is not only unproductive, but is also detrimental to the mental health of many of our middle and high school students. The school board has no definite, definitive timeline for bringing secondary school students back to school for full-time in-person instruction at this time, how are you going to specifically support mental health needs of our middle and high school students? Specifically, I'd like to know, number one, what type of mental health support will the school district guarantee for every single student that needs it? Number two, what means of mental health support has the district set up for checking in with students? Number three, what system has been put in place for students to reach out for mental health support. Number four, who's responsible to check in with students and make sure that they are okay, that they can get through today and that they will make it to class tomorrow. If number five, if my student's mental health is seriously affected by this virtual learning environment and his, and his or her grades are seriously suffering, who do I reach out to? And finally, at this time, how often is the school district checking in on our students' mental health? Because no one has checked in on my middle schooler's mental health. No one. I sure hope this is only my family and others have been checked in on. 
I don't know how long you expect this virtual learning environment to last before we as a community have some serious mental health issues on our hands. Two days in school for middle and high school students is not enough. Where is your mental health plan and how are you going to handle the outcome of this virtual learning environment that has become extremely detrimental to so many kids? If you're not able to answer my questions here tonight, then I expect the answer through some sort of community communication as soon as possible. Please hear me loud and clear. This virtual learning environment is not working for many and the mental health of our students, specifically high school and middle school is in jeopardy. Every single student, no matter what, has a right to be in school today and every single day. Thank you. Great, right, thank you. Um, I see Francis Graham is, has a hand up. Ms. Evans, can you? Go ahead, Ms. Graham. Hi, good evening. Francis Graham from Fort Washington. I had a, a similar question regarding mental health, more specifically on for those students on really on the elementary level who are going back to school um, soon. There doesn't seem to have been addressed. What doesn't seem to have been addressed is the anxiety and fear that some of these students have about going back after being out for so long. I've reached out uh, locally a little bit and um, was told that you know a student can reach out to so and so and reach out to this person, but more on a global perspective, could there be something done where the guidance or some the psychologist somebody is popping into the classrooms before they go back to school to have a conversation with the students in a productive way about you know the, the things that they're feeling. Um, it, it doesn't seem to have happened from my perspective, from what I've seen yet. I'm just wondering if there's a plan. What I'm told is, you know, there will be conversation on the day that they go back, but, you know, could it be, even though it's now, it's Wednesday, it's probably too late, but what could be done ahead of time in terms of preparing them for really the trauma that they've experienced being out of school for all of these months? Thank you. Thank you. Um... Ms. Evans. Um, Go ahead, Ms. Johnson. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Okay. I'm Caitlin Johnson. I have a first grader at Fort Washington Elementary School. I live in Ambler. And I just wanted to comment on just how great I feel like everyone's working so hard together to try to make everything as successful as it can be for our kids. And today, my first grader who was really excited to go to school, woke up this morning and started crying and was like, I don't want to go to school. And I'm like, okay, um, let's give it a try. We can always change and go back to school at home. And I just want to give such a kudos to Fort Washington and the students and everyone because when he went to school, he was obviously nervous and not sure about all the new roles and the new friends and all this. And when he came home, he was so excited to say, can I go back to school tomorrow? So I just, and he, I was very happy to hear that he didn't spend all day on his Chromebook. Um, so I know that there's so many changes going on, but I just wanted to say, so many people seem concerned that I am um, today, and I just hope that this continues with other families if and when they decide to go in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see no more hands up. So I'll close community input and I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Yanni or uh, Mr. Hoffman if you want to comment on. I'll start and then I'll, um, Mr. Hoffman is welcome to join in and as is uh, Dr. Perez and uh, Ms. Penner. So um, one of the things that um, we want to be clear about when kids are in front of us, yes, there will be time with technology technology, but it won't be solely with technology because um, in the blended learning model, um, we are using a number of resources, but students will also be doing uh, non-technology related work. So that's, that's really the first thing. The other piece, when we look at all of the different technology that we're using, all of the different applications, all of the different programs, those programs are only as good as the teacher who's implementing it. So 
you know, kids are not being taught exclusively by a, uh, you know, an adaptive piece of software. Um, these technology resources supplement and complement good instruction. Um, they don't supplant it or they don't take the place of it. Um, and Mr. Hoffman, would you like to um, add anything onto that? Sure. I mean, I would say, you know, I remember when uh, I was in the classroom, students would, you know, and I, I think this is probably still the case in some that, you know, kids walk around with these book bags that have 47 books in them. And, you know, the resources that we use for students now to make sure that they're most up to date, most relevant are a lot of these uh, uh, digital resources now. So they're not walking around with 20 text books, but they may have access to different programs uh, to help them provide that. So Edpuzzle is that example. Rather than, you know, reading 20 pages of a book or sitting for 20 to 30 minutes of a lecture, they're going to be hearing uh, short snippets, short chapters of direct instruction from their teacher or from a teacher in our district, uh, and then have embedded questions along the way. I don't see that as um, uh, learning passively. I don't see that as asynchronous learning. Asynchronous means that it's happening at any time during the day. As Mrs. Kowalski uh, was really clear, um, this is live action in a classroom. So a teacher, is, it's not possible for a teacher to do a problem on the board and give feedback to the 25 students in his or her classroom live for every problem when it's on paper and pencil. When they're able to, and some of it is their paper pencil and they're submitting that into that uh, tool, as she said, and getting the feedback back. There is that choice and flexibility, but others are using, they're very native to uh, the stylus and others, that they're getting that immediate feedback um, in specific feedback live in a classroom, as opposed to waiting in that isolation again, that they go home, they do those problems at home, and they come back the next day and are told that they either did it right or did it wrong. That live feedback is kind of transforming what's happening. And so, um, you know, we hear uh, regularly from students, we've, uh, from parents reaching out uh, about the impact that that uh, has had on their own students as well. Um, that it that the feedback is more personalized uh, regarding the Alex program um, you know I wasn't able to comment on it last last fall because it was new to me as well um, but to see that our sixth grade students uh, are reaching mastery at 97 98 percent across the board in the first two units at the beginning of the school year already uh, that's standards aligned that's focused that's huge. They're not able to hide behind the B or the, the lucky guesses or the multiple attempts there. They're getting that uh, immediate feedback and progression. So the pace, uh, we heard from our elementary uh, math teachers today that were saying the resources that they have available, they are at pace, if not further ahead than normal because of the very specific uh, instruction and focus on that standards that they're able to do this fall. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's all that I had down. Dave, I just wanted to jump in and add around the, the topic of engagement. You know, it's a hot topic for us right now about cameras on, cameras off. You know, we really need to think about when we talked about universal design and blended learning and all the principles of multiple ways kids can demonstrate that they're engaged and, and show that accountability and that mastery of content. That's engagement. That's demonstrating that they were able to absorb the information, manipulate the information, and demonstrate that they understand it. It's not compliance-based. The same way kids sitting in front of a teacher in a classroom, they're physically present. It doesn't mean they're engaged. When we do um, walkthroughs from teacher evaluations, we always talk about evidence. Evidence of student engagement is not sitting in a seat with their eyes open. Evidence of student engagement virtually is not forced compliance to have your camera on. You know, you could have another window open, you could be watching a movie, Ginny's example of playing a game. You could be texting a friend, you know, teachers at the very beginning wanted us to make a no cell phone at home rule. You know, and again, and those are things we can't control. Those are things that are compliance based and we really wanna focus and shift our attention to active engagement strategies, getting kids excited, giving them choice, having them part of that learning experience and 
all the examples from the teachers today were about those instructional interactions and then the ways kids interact throughout the lesson and, and ultimately in their um, authentic assessments. So there are a lot of conversations. It's different. People sometimes feel that we're trying to force and parallel everything that we've done in brick and mortar into a teachers to walk back in on Monday, trying to teach the old way. You know, we're really excited about the doors that have opened with some of this, uh, some of these new practices. So I just wanted to add that piece about um, engagement and really what it looks like. All right. Um, thank the other you. piece, Mr. Sherbier, I'll just say, and we'll we'll make sure that this is put in the FAQs along with um, some additional resources. You know, even though um, we don't have kids in school, we still have our child study teams. We still have our student assistance program. We still have safe to say, we still have uh, our counselors and social workers working uh, with kids. So what we will do is we will make sure that um, we make that much more overt so that folks know what we're doing to um, support kids. And then the last item is we were, um, we're meeting with our principals. So we will uh, reinforce to our principals that um, for our students that are staying in the Cardinal Academy, um, we want to be very clear that, that that is not a lesser option. And so we want to make sure that, um, you know, to do as good a job as possible, making sure that that transition uh, with new teachers, et cetera, goes really well. So we'll, we'll work with our principals to make, uh, make sure that's much more overt as well. And regarding Ms. Greiner's question about that, I, I do just want to mention, not an excuse uh, at all, uh, but to just kind of offer the perspective that our, uh, because of the shuffling of some of the rostering that we knew was going to happen uh, this week and bringing back our K-1-2 students uh, to the building today, three, four, five, maintaining in Cardinal Academy through this week, it hit our special area teachers in the middle of a rotation. Um, and so what we were able to provide with our kindergarten uh, earlier in the year uh, where um, the different, uh, you know, the Fitz and the Maple Glen teacher were co-teaching uh, special areas to be that common uh, face for our students because of, of the overlapping right now of the homeschools layered with Cardinal Academy and then having in-person and uh and still the three five Cardinal Academy, it hasn't made the schedule uh, line up the way that it will next Monday. So we'll have more of those familiar faces and those, those connections. We knew that going in, but obviously communication can always be stronger with that message. All right, thank you. Um, are there any board members with questions or comments? Um, I, I teach you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, yeah, I was just going to uh, sort of echo a little bit what, or maybe piggyback on what Dave just said. Is I my children are staying in Cardinal Academy, and it has been a good experience. And I did have the elementary teacher reach out to me, but my kids don't start till Monday. So I think that's kind of what Dave was saying. Like my, it's, we had a little leeway, a little lead time that maybe the teachers I'm thinking today did not have as much time. That's all. All right. Thank you. Um, then I think we are hey, at the end. Teacher. Yeah. Oh, oh uh, yeah. I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing any hands up. So I'm sorry. Maybe there was something not right in my. Oh. Well, yeah. uh, I just wanted to call attention. There were a couple of concerns about guidance. I thought maybe somebody could comment on. And there was also a question that I think was about semester long classes. Um, it wasn't phrased that way, but that's the note I took. Uh, if somebody could comment. So yeah, so block scheduling, uh, one of the district's goals this year is to look at our secondary schedule. Um, you know, the, the board knows that last year um, we went and we took a look at the Sandy Run schedule. Uh, this year we are looking at um, the high school schedule. And I would anticipate that um, after working with um, our administrators and our staff and getting impact, uh, input from students, we probably will be bringing some or forth some sort of recommendations for a change in our high school schedule. We know there are some pain points in our high school schedule. Um, the other piece about um, guidance, just to reiterate, we do have our child study teams, our SAP teams, our counselors are available. Um, but again, we will make um, that information much more overt to the community. Um, you know, it, 
the steps of communication still remain um, the same, even though we're um, in the middle of a pandemic. And so, um, but we will we will make the efforts that our counselors are uh, are doing much more overt. All right, and I think my screen unfroze, so that is helpful. Uh, I do not see any more hands. So um, I really want to thank everybody in attendance, um, especially staff and community members for their contributions, their questions, um, and also for all our presenters. And um, I think at this point, what I would like to highlight is that our next meeting is on December. And oh, I think Ms. Evans just went off the screen. Was it December 2nd? December 2nd. Yes. So December 2nd at six o'clock, um, who knows, maybe we will be in person uh, or perhaps we're still uh, uh, remote or um, online. Either way, uh, we hope to see you and um, at this and I'd like to adjourn, adjourn our meeting uh, tonight. Thank you all. So long. Bye bye. bye. bye.